Our first reading is called Why I Am a Unitarian and is taken from the writings of Reverend Ethelred Brown. I was a choir boy of the Montego Bay Episcopal Church when the first light broke through my Trinitarianism. It was Easter Sunday and the Athanasian Creed was recited by the priest and the congregation. The strangeness of the Trinitarian arithmetic struck me forcibly, so forcibly that I decided then and there to sever my connection with the church, which enunciated so impossible a proposition. That afternoon, I visited my uncle and happened to find a copy of Channing's sermon, Unitarian Christianity. I followed up by reading other Unitarian literature, and as a result, I became a Unitarian. I believed and still believe in Unitarianism as the religion of the future, the religion with an emancipatory message for people who have long since outgrown intellectually and morally the fundamental teachings of the older churches. Unitarianism is a religion profoundly concerned with this world and making this earth a place wherein dwell justice and peace and love. Well, good morning again, everyone. It's good to be with you all. Welcome to the UU Congregation of Charlottesville service honoring Black History Month. Tori, very nice job this morning. May I say that you handled your Trinitarian arithmetic exceptionally well. <laughs> I have to say, I am really looking forward to sharing with you some of the story of one of the most remarkable and visionary leaders in the history of our faith, Reverend Ethelred, Egbert Ethelred Brown. Reverend Brown was a minister, a humanist, and the founder of two Unitarian congregations, one in his home country of Jamaica and the other in New York City. His story is one of extraordinary courage, creativity, and resilience in the face of the racism and white supremacy he encountered throughout his life and including in this denomination, Unitarian Universalism. So Reverend Brown's story begins in Jamaica where he was born in July of 1875. From an early age, he showed an inclination to religion and a talent for public speaking and family members remarked that he was likely to become either a minister or a lawyer. He also displayed a skeptical questioning mind, which did not always get the approval of his elders. As Brown recalled, he was an inquisitive youngster and a truthful child. Once he was in Sunday school um, and asking uh, his Sunday school teacher about the biblical story of God destroying the walls of Jericho. So why, did young Ethelred ask, did God waste so much time when he could have brought down the walls on the first day? Yeah, those are the kind of questions that make some, some Sunday school teachers squirm a little. And as Brown recalled, his question wasn't particularly well received. Now, as you heard in the reading, Brown's questioning mind led him to reject the Christian doctrine of the Trinity. And what a wonderful coincidence that on the very day that he decided he could no longer accept the dogmas of his church, he happened upon the most important sermon in the history of this tradition, William Ellery Channing's Unitarian Christianity. In that sermon, Ethelred Brown found a vision of religion that stressed a God of love rather than judgment, and the use of reason in religion rather than what he saw as superstition. That was the moment, that was the aha moment when Ethelred Brown knew that he was a Unitarian. And the more he read and learned about Unitarianism, the more Brown came to see a radical religion capable of liberating the oppressed, including people of color living under white colonial rule in Jamaica and African Americans here in the United States. The problem with Christianity in Brown's view 
was not only doctrines and dogmas and Trinitarian math, but also the emphasis placed on the afterlife rather than on the problems and injustices of this world. Too often, Brown felt this otherworldly perspective was a distraction that led far too many Christians, both black and white, to focus on paradise in the next life rather than on, as I said before, the injustices right in front of them. But in Unitarianism, Brown found a religion with what he felt was an emancipatory message of hope for all people. Unitarians were free and encouraged to question, to explore, and to be themselves. Brown also found in Unitarianism a religion that was focused so much of attention, so much of its attention on making the world a better place, a world where justice, peace, and love could dwell. And it was that message of religious freedom and that concern for a better world that led Ethelred Brown to dedicate his life to Unitarianism. Unfortunately, when Brown tried to turn his passion for our faith, for this faith, into action, what he found was a religion whose practices did not always live up to its principles. The emancipatory message Brown found so inspiring and so promising seemed to be reserved primarily for those who were white and privileged. Previous efforts to spread the faith to people of color had met with only lukewarm support and at times outright indifference. In addition, Brown soon discovered that far too many white Unitarians were primarily concerned with one part of Unitarianism's emancipatory message, namely intellectual freedom, freedom of conscience, separation of church and state, but not as focused so much on justice and liberation for the oppressed. Thankfully, and I even would say surprisingly, these blind spots in our faith and our tradition did not discourage Ethelred Brown. He not only remained a Unitarian, he decided to become a Unitarian minister. With little encouragement or support from the denomination, he enrolled at Meadville Theological School in 1910 and was ordained as a Unitarian minister two years later. He then returned to Jamaica and founded the Unitarian Church in Kingston. But not long after the Kingston Church was established, Brown began encountering that racism and white supremacy that put up one roadblock after another throughout his ministerial career. After the name of our denomination at the time, the Unitarian side, known as the American Unitarian Association, after they withdrew their financial support from the Kingston congregation, Brown struggled on for several years before he was forced, in his words, to pull down the flag of Unitarianism in Jamaica. <clears throat> now, as, as I said a minute ago, I don't know about you, but had I been eth in Ethelred Brown's position, I might have given up on Unitarianism. I mean, what was the point of trying to bring the Unitarian message to people of color when it was so clear the powers that be were indifferent and perhaps even hostile? Thankfully, thankfully, Ethelred Brown was made of much sterner stuff than I am, and he didn't give up his dream of bringing the values and message of this faith to people of color. Instead, as he wrote in an autobiographical sketch, with a broken heart, but with my faith in Unitarianism still strong, I had to say goodbye to Kingston, Jamaica, and landed in New York in February of 1920. And here begins the history of my second congregation, the Harlem Unitarian Church. I'm going to tell you more about that church and the rest of Ethelred Brown's story in a moment, but I'm going to invite Tori now to read for you the, um, we're talking a lot about mission and purpose here in our congregation, 
And Reverend Brown, I mean, I'm assuming Reverend Brown, Brown probably wrote this statement of purpose for the Harlem Unitarian Church. I think it's pretty great, and I'd like to ask Tori to share it with us now. Statement of purpose of the Harlem Unitarian Church. The Harlem Unitarian Church is a temple and a forum, a temple in which we worship the true, the good, and the beautiful, and receive inspiration to live a life of service and a forum wherein mind sharpens mind as we strive to plumb the depths, span the breadth, and scale the heights of knowledge. Seeking truth and freedom, it strives to apply it in love for the cultivation of character, the fostering of fellowship in work and worship, and the establishment of a righteous social order which shall bring abundance of life to man. Knowing not sect, class, nation, or race, it welcomes each to the service of all. That's pretty good. It welcomes each to the service of all. That's the church I'd want to belong to, I can tell you that. And I have to say that that mission purpose statement there I think it's one of the most inspiring visions of what Unitarian Universalism ought to be about and what a community that calls itself Unitarian Universalist ought to be striving to do. And you know, for over 35 years, 35 years from the day Brown and eight others first gathered to form what came to be known as the Harlem Unitarian Church in 1920, until his death in 1956, Reverend Brown led, dreamed, inspired, and struggled to build a Unitarian religious community for all people, black and white, skeptic and believer, Unitarian and members of other faiths or of no faith at all. Due to a chronic lack of resources and a, what I'm going to call a shameful lack of support from the American Unitarian Association, the Harlem Unitarian Church never had a building of its own, and Reverend Brown, for many, many years, never drew a salary and had to spend his time working other jobs simply to feed his family. But you know what? He still didn't throw in the towel. He never gave up. He never lost his faith in the power of Unitarianism to transform lives and transform the world. Now, in addition to being incredibly racist, the failure to support Reverend Brown and the Harlem Unitarian Church was one of the most short-sighted mistakes I think our denomination has ever, ever made. Think about your African-American history for a moment. Is it, it's hard for me to imagine a better time in our nation's history to have helped establish a Unitarian congregation in Harlem since the founding of Reverend Brown's church coincided with that great flowering of Black culture and creativity known as the Harlem Renaissance. This was a time when traditions were being questioned, free expression was flourishing, and radical new ways of thinking about politics and society were being debated and tested. I mean, is that not a golden opportunity and moment to try to plant a Unitarian congregation? And it was squandered. And not because there wasn't a brilliant visionary leader who worked his heart out to make it happen. And don't get me wrong, the work that Reverend Brown did in Harlem was a success, with a small but dedicated group of lay leaders working side by side with Reverend Brown. The Harlem Unitarian Church was indeed a temple where the good, the true, and the beautiful were worshiped. The Harlem Unitarian Church was most certainly a forum where mind sharpened mind and where people plumb the depths of human knowledge. And the Harlem Unitarian Church was indeed a beloved community dedicated to the service of humanity and to the building of a righteous social order. 
but throughout its 36-year history, the congregation was small. And no matter how hard Reverend Brown and the lay leaders tried, the financial struggling community never counted more than 100 members, and most years had fewer than 50. And although it would be easy to look at factors internal to the church, the simple truth is that the Harlem Unitarian Church remained small because that, my friends, is the way the white Unitarian power structure wanted it. For those who want to learn more about the details of Reverend Brown and the Harlem Unitarian Church's relationship with the wider denomination, you can do no better than to read this classic history by Mark Morrison Reed, Reverend Mark Morrison Reed, that he wrote as his PhD thesis back in the 1980s. It is still a fabulous read, Black Pioneers in a White Denomination. I highly recommend it. You can get it online from uh, the EUA bookstore online and such. So please do read that book. So let me sum up that relationship by saying that from the moment the church held its first gathering in 1920 until at least the late 1930s, the American Unitarian Association refused to offer the congregation one penny of support, and they worked to undermine Reverend Brown, including at one point suspending his ministerial fellowship for over a decade. They called him, and see if these adjectives sound familiar, deceitful, dishonest, histrionic, all adjectives that have long been in the vocabulary of white supremacy culture. From all that I have read about Reverend Brown and his relationship with the AUA, it seems pretty clear to me that his real offense, at least in the eyes of the white power structure at the time, and I'm going to be blunt here, his offense was preaching and leading a Unitarian congregation while black. That was his offense. <clears throat> now, with a change in national leadership in the late 1930s, Reverend Brown and the church began to receive a little support. His ministerial fellowship was restored, and he soon qualified for a pension. He was now in his 60s from the denomination, meaning that Reverend Brown, because he got some income, could stop doing all the other jobs he was doing and devote himself full time to his ministry. Think about that, a minister who had the creativity, the courage, and the resilience to plant a Unitarian congregation almost entirely on his own, had to wait until he turned practically basically 65 to receive any support from our denomination. But that financial support always remained limited. Reverend Brown, in an unpublished history of the church that he wrote, talks about a capital campaign that he very excitedly, he and the church excitedly launched in the mid 1940s, I think it was 46, in hopes of raising the money to build a building, to acquire a church building. With a small congregation, it's not surprising the campaign came up short. And again, no help was forthcoming from the national denomination. And I just wanna make a point here about that, something that's not in this book, but in case you're wondering, you know, maybe the denomination was strapped for cash. They couldn't afford it, right? Well, just remember, the mid to late 1940s, it was during this same time period that the American Unitarian Association was indeed providing loans and grants to new congregations that were predominantly white, including, my friends, this congregation the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Charlottesville. For those who are not aware, we might very well not be meeting in this sanctuary today had it not been for the financial support alone from the American Unitarian Association. The denomination, as I said, provided a loan, and I also have read that it sometimes provided additional funds to sustain a struggling church budget in the early years. Now, I'm not making this comparison between our congregation's beginnings and the way the Harlem Unitarian Church was treated to in any way condemn or criticize the founders of this congregation or to suggest that the UU congregation of Charlottesville should have never been created. I think our denomination was right to seed or plant a Unitarian congregation in Charlottesville, Virginia. 
but they should have done the same for Reverend Brown and the Harlem Unitarian Church, especially since it was established decades before this congregation was. And I also make this comparison because it reveals something important, I think, about the question that white Unitarian Universalists, and myself included, have asked year after year, decade after decade. Why are there not more people of color in our congregations, right? As the story of Reverend Brown and his congregation shows, for much of our history, for much of our history, the reason there have not been more African American Unitarian Universalists is because that's the way white Unitarian Universalists, including and especially our denominational leaders, wanted it. It's not an answer I'm sure you want to hear. It's not an easy one to hear. It's not an easy one for me to say, but friends, it's the truth. And let me just close with this. If we are to be the religion of the future that Reverend Brown put his hopes in, we UUs have got to have the courage to look at ourselves honestly. We've got to learn about the racism and white supremacy in our past so that we can eliminate it in the present. We've got to recognize and celebrate the extraordinary contributions of Unitarian Universalists like Reverend Ethel Red Brown. And we've got to have the wisdom and the will to create a Unitarian Universalism that is truly welcoming and emancipatory for all people. After decades of being called names and denied support, Reverend Brown still believed passionately in Unitarianism as at the end of his life. Listen to these words from his later writings that sum up the courage and the resilience of this incredible leader and visionary. He said, our work has not failed, not failed at all. We, the Harlem Unitarian Church, have compelled many churches to soften their emphasis on the old outmoded doctrines. And in fact, Harlem is today, theologically speaking, a different and better place because we were here. Amen, Reverend Brown. And we Unitarian Universalists are so blessed by your courage and your vision. May we be worthy of that vision and may we carry forward your ministry, your dream and your work. Amen, blessed be. And thank you so very much for listening this morning.